Begin transmission from Redacted, Quarantine Level 24. I'm not sure how much time I have before they track this, but there's a lot to go over and I want to make sure that every detail is recorded. If this is the only time that I'm able to contact the outside world, I want somebody to know what really happened on November 13th in Redacted. The newspaper said it was a minor power surge caused by a blown transformer at the Redacted power plant. Well, they lied. Something was unleashed that night. Something that I still can't quite explain, but I'll be damned if they keep the truth buried down here with me. And it. The whole thing started with the drains. November 13th, midnight. Hey, last chance to chicken out, I said. I was with my two best friends from high school. We'll call them Colton and Abby. The three of us had dressed for the occasion. Black long sleeve shirts, black jeans, black shoes, black hats. We stood in a large, concrete basin, staring at the entrance to a massive storm drain. Somebody had graffitied the phrase, Abandon all hope above its opening. I'm not chickening out, Abby said, adjusting her backpack. But I don't want to get COVID-23, Ebola, or whatever else is in there. She put on a mask. A trickle of brownish sludge flowed from the drain's entranceway. A mixture of rainwater, decaying plant matter, and God knows what else. It had a slightly musty smell. And probably nothing serious. Hopefully still, Abby had a point. I donned an N95 myself. And Colton just grabbed a black bandana from his pack and wrapped it around his nose and mouth. Alright, let's do this. He slung a heavy backpack over his shoulder. Can you pack your whole closet in there? Abby asked. It's just some extra flashlights and batteries, Colton said. Can't be too careful. Ah, fine by me, Abby said. So long as you're the one that's carrying it. And Colton smirked. Neither he nor Abby had been urban exploring before, unlike me. I had already been on countless expeditions with my urbex group, the Night Riders, which was just me and two of my best friends since grade school. And we would drive around late at night on the weekends and explore abandoned locations around our hometown. Old paper mills, condemned mental hospitals, abandoned and allegedly haunted mansions. We would snap photos, record videos, and tag walls with graffiti, while uploading the images and videos to our TikTok, Night Riders Airbax. It was dumb and dangerous, but being 16 in a small town, you tend to do dumb and dangerous things for fun. The Night Riders was how I discovered the storm drains and learned that they led to our local power plant. We'll call it the Frog Hollow Power Plant. And we didn't explore the plant ourselves. It wasn't an abandoned facility and we didn't want to risk getting arrested for trespassing. But I made note of the plant and included its location when we mapped the drainage system. How far do we have to go? Abby asked. I checked my hand-drawn drains map. I had made it for the Night Riders. It was a large sheet of sketch paper filled with crisscrossing pathways, originally drawn in pencil and later traced over in ink. I had marked each drain with a corresponding color and approximate distance. Yellow tunnel, a 15 minute walk. Blue tunnel, a 30 minute walk. My finger ran across all the tunnels that we would have to traverse to make it to Frog Hollow. It's about an hour's walk. An hour in there. Colton stared into the dark void beyond the drain's entrance. I met him through an after-school club that I had joined to boost my resume for college applications. It was called the Eagle Eco Warriors, named after our school mascot, the Eagles. I say that I joined to boost my resume, but I also had a crush on Abby Williams, the club's historian, a state championship winning track star and consistently voted among the school's top babes. I had never had the courage to say more than a few words to Abby in the English class that we shared. But I figured joining the Eco Warriors would force us to interact more. And it did. Abby took a real interest in my outdoorsy hobbies. Hiking, fishing, biking. And I realized that we shared a lot of the same interests. 
including a love of classic 80s and 90s horror flicks. But I also learned that she was dating the Eco Warriors president and co-founder, Colton. And the night of November 13th was Colton's idea. He had conceived of the plan even before he had found out about my adventures with the Knight Riders and the secret entrance to Frog Hollow. And Colton, like many residents of our town, was fed up with the power plant on its outskirts. There had been rumors of toxic leaks going back decades, but every official investigation into the plant's operations turned up nothing. It was as if the power company had paid off every politician and law enforcement official, forcing them to look the other way while locals reported strange illnesses and weird, foul-smelling water flowing from their faucets. Somebody needs to expose them, Colton said at our eco-warriors meetings. Everybody knows that they're dumping waste into the river. We just can't get out of the property to prove it. And then Colton heard about my drains map. Thin root tendrils hung from the curved concrete ceiling like matted hair. We had to duck down to keep from hitting them as we walked through the drains. I led the group with my map, using a headlamp to light the way. The lamp's halogen bulb only illuminated a few feet into the darkness, but at least it was bright enough to reveal any obstacles in our way. We kept our legs far apart so as to not step in the thin stream of brownish-green sludge that was flowing along the drain's base. I captured some short clips of the journey on my iPhone and close-ups on a tiny spider dangling from a silvery web on the ceiling. Footage of moss hovering near my headlamp like furry little helicopters. Our plan was to upload footage to our socials using hashtags like Frog Hollow Corruption and Frog Hollow Pollution after the trip. The holy grail would be video of toxic waste dumping on the plant grounds. It was something that many locals suspected. But till that time, I figured I would grab some nice moody shots to use for a future Knight Rider pose. We stopped for a water break at a concrete junction point halfway there. Abby and Colton both seemed less anxious than the larger space. I captured more footage of graffiti on the concrete walls left by previous urban explorers. One piece in particular stood out. Somebody had painted a detailed circuit board like something that you would see in an old electronics manual. It was painted in black save for one red image in its center. I moved closer to get a better look. All the circuits led to a grotesque humanoid stick figure in red at the center. The figure had an odd shape, obscenely long arms and an extra head growing from its back, and three red eyes. Staring at it, I felt a strange sensation like a static shock. It enveloped my skin for a few seconds and then quickly dissipated. I took a picture of the image. Perhaps the other Knight Riders would know the artist. Whoever it was, they were insanely talented and insanely creepy. Now we're making good time, Colton said, checking a gold watch on his wrist. A hey, nice bling, Abby said. It was a heavy looking timepiece, one of those popular luxury brands like Rolex or Breitling. Thanks, Colton said, twisting the watch on his arm. It was my dad's. Oh, Abby fell silent. We all knew about Mr. Harrison. His death was perhaps the biggest factor driving Colton's mission to shut down Frog Hollow. And Colton's dad grew up in Tall Pines, a neighborhood just across the river from the power plant. Back in those days, the plant ran on coal, and the pollution problem was much worse. For years, the residents of Tall Pines complained of brown water coming from their pipes, and a general stench in the air, like rotten eggs mixed with burnt copper. But because the neighborhood was home to low-income families, almost all of whom were black or brown, the city government made virtually no effort to clean up the mess. And this lasted for decades. It took a class action lawsuit and the publicity of an Emmy-nominated TV documentary, The Corrupted Heart of Frog Hollow, to finally bring about real change in the late 90s. The Frog Hollow Power Company updated their plan to make it more environmentally friendly. The plant was turned into a state-of-the-art natural gas facility, capable of providing 10 times the power at a quarter of the cost. And they never provided more concrete information than that. 
Most folks believe that they just plugged up all the toxic leaks. But at least the city had relocated all the residents of Tall Pines free of charge. They were placed in cheap townhomes on the other side of town, a full 20 miles away from the power plant. And that's where Colton was born and grew up. Tall Pines was a left abandoned, deemed too expensive to demolish. The neighborhood was condemned, becoming the source of many local urban legends. I had been there once with the Night Riders. It was eerie seeing all those suburban homes covered in coots though. Their roofs collapsed and windows and doors boarded up. I refused to go back once I met Colton and heard his story. Even though the city had relocated Tall Pines residents, many of them were already carrying lifelong ailments. Residents like Mr. Harrison, Colton's father had suffered gastrointestinal issues since he was a child, but they didn't become serious until middle age. At 50, he was often vomiting blood and couldn't hold down any solid food. It turned out to be stomach cancer. Mr. Harrison spent five years battling the disease and fighting for a settlement from Frog Hollow. He ended up losing both battles. The way Colton explained it, there wasn't enough evidence to prove pollution and cause the disease. The whole affair had devastated the family. Colton was only 10 at the time. He became deeply depressed and antisocial in junior high, bullying other kids and picking fights on the playground after school. It wasn't until high school that he started seeing a therapist and getting his life back on track. Most of his current classmates didn't even know that he had suffered such a horrible tragedy. It's okay, Colton said, twisting the watch's dial. I wanted him here with us tonight. Abby laid a comforting hand on Colton's shoulder. He is. A few quiet moments passed. We sat there listening to the soft, steady trickle of water flowing through the drains. And then Colton got up, slinging his heavy backpack over his shoulder. Let's keep moving. Do you hear that? The drains were growing wider, almost wide enough for us to walk side by side. We were close to our destination. I was still leading the way, consulting my map. There it is again. Abby cocked her head. There what is? I asked. Wait, shh. Abby stopped walking. Colton and I did too. Listen. All I could hear was our muffled breathing beneath the masks and the occasional dripping of water from the ceiling. But after a moment, I heard this soft croaking noise. It was very faint. So faint that I almost thought it was in my head at first. What is that? I hear it too, Colton said. It's coming from ahead of us. Abby said, and she looked pale. I took out my trusty mag light, a heavy duty flashlight in case of emergencies. I don't see anything. I said, aiming it ahead. My mag light only illuminated more of the concrete tunnel before terminating into darkness. Guys, it's just some stupid frog. Colton brushed past us and kept moving. Abby and I quickly followed. I kept the mag light pointed ahead. As we walked further, it lit up a square junction point. I nearly dropped my flashlight when Abby gasped. She was the first to see them. Stop! We came to a halt just before the junction's entrance. There were hundreds of them sitting motionless in the darkness. Bullfrogs. Their fat green bodies shined like slimy rocks in the light. I pulled out my cell to record the odd tableau. There were bullfrogs squatting everywhere. The floors, the walls, even a few hanging from the ceiling. But that wasn't the strangest thing. They're all facing the same direction, Abby whispered. She was right. All the frogs stared at a small blue-green fungus growing in the middle of the junction. It was shaped like a flower. Okay, this is really weird, I said. Have you ever seen anything like this? Abby asked. The frogs remained motionless. I shook my head. The strangest thing that I had ever seen urban exploring was a group of rats with their tails stuck together. 
It was freaky, but apparently not unknown to science. I googled it later and found out it was a phenomenon called a rat king. But this, I had seen plenty of bullfrogs exploring at night, but never so many and in such an odd formation. And with the fungus, I don't think frogs are supposed to do this, I said. I would look it up, but my signal shot down here. Yeah, same here. Abby had her phone out too. Now they're probably just resting, Colton said. He seemed antsy. Jason, which way do we go next? Jason, Jason! I looked up suddenly realizing that I'd been staring at the fungus just like the frogs. The plant's pale flesh-like body glowed faintly in the dark. Uh, sorry, what? Your map, which way next? There's two different tunnels ahead. Hold on, we're still going ahead? Abby asked. Yeah, Colton said. He started to enter the junction. Uh, babe, wait. But nothing crazy happened. Colton just brushed some of the frogs aside with his boot. They all hopped out of the way. But they always repositioned themselves to face the fungus again. You see, there's nothing to be scared of. Jason, which tunnel? I checked the map. Uh, to the left. Come on. I don't like this, Colton, Abby said. Babe, we're not turning back. Uh, but the fungus. It's just more evidence that Frog Hollow is messing up nature with its pollution, Colton said. And more reason for us to get them back. Right, Jason? He pulled down his bandana, staring at me. I sighed. I was usually the one to settle disputes between the couple. Colton was the risk taker. Abby was the cautious one. While I landed somewhere in the middle. I hated being the one to make the decision, much preferring to go with the flow. But there were three of us, so it made sense that I would be the tiebreaker. My gut leaned towards going back. I didn't want to make Abby any more upset than she already was. But then I saw the look on Colton's face. The quiet, simmering anger. The longing for revenge. I recalled Colton telling us about the last time that he saw his father. <laughs> Just a skeleton covered in bed sores. But then my mag light hit on something further down the left tunnel, where we were supposed to go next. It was a rusty ladder and I knew right where it would take us. <laughs> we're almost there, I said pointing at the ladder. Abby shot me a look that I'll never forget. A look of utter bewilderment. But then she said, Well, let's get this done then. We quickly stepped through the sea of bullfrogs. Abby and I made sure to follow Colton's footsteps exactly, since he had cleared the animals out with his boots. It wasn't nearly as terrifying as I had expected. We were through the junction before I knew it, and then to the rusted ladder, and back up to the surface. It took all of our strength, but Colton and I managed to lift the manhole cover so that we could climb out. We arrived in the outskirts of the power plant, next to a series of nondescript warehouses. Security lights dotted the featureless buildings, bathing the area in a soft yellow gloom. The night air was chilly. A deep, rhythmic hum surrounded us. It was the sound of the plant's many generators and substations. The main power plant structure loomed in the distance, a series of giant windowless buildings covered in miles of complex metal tubing and topped with thin chimneys that spewed smoke and flame into the cloudy night. It looked like an alien city. The three of us stayed low behind some bushes, our eyes peeled for any security cameras or guards nearby, but the place appeared abandoned. See, there's no one around. Colton whispered. He knew someone who had worked security at the plant some years back. The informant had mentioned that the outlying area was barely patrolled between midnight and 2am. I checked my watch. It was 1.03. We had almost an hour left. Well, okay, the retention pond is just over there. I pointed to a dark patch of water nearby. Let's go grab some shots and get out of here. Wait. Colton held up his hand. What? What is it? 
and Colton pulled down his bandana. He had a strange look on his face like he was nauseous. There's something that I need to do real quick. It'll only take a few minutes, just stay here. And before either of us could ask him more, he scurried off into the dark, keeping to the shadows. Colton, Abby gave the loudest whisper that she could. Get back here right now. But her boyfriend didn't turn back. He had already disappeared behind a nearby warehouse. What the heck is going on? I asked. I don't know. He didn't tell you anything. No, Abby pulled off her mask. She was clearly flustered, breathing heavily. He always does stuff like this. Like what? Oh, changing plans midstream, Abby sighed. I had never suspected her and Colton to be having a hard time. They were touted as relationship goals by everybody at school. Abby started to follow Colton. Oh, come on. Oh, wait a minute, I said. He told us to stay here. Yeah, I'm not going to let him get arrested for doing something stupid, Abby said. Or worse. She didn't have to say the rest. We both knew that a six foot black kid at trespassing at a power plant could have dire consequences. Abby and I stayed low to the ground using any nearby foliage for cover. Crickets chirped nearby. We put our masks back on. If any security cameras caught us, at least they wouldn't see our faces. I'm going to kill him, Abby said under her breath. And that's when a flash of movement caught my eye. Abby, there. I pointed to an area roughly a hundred yards away. It was Colton. He was headed for an electrical substation. A field of giant metal transformers and circuit breakers connected by crisscrossing wires. This area was the source of the deep rhythmic hum that had permeated the air ever since we had arrived on the power plant property. What the heck is he doing? Abby asked. Colton took off his heavy backpack, setting it next to the largest transformer, and then he removed a metal box covered in colorful wires. It had an old flip phone attached to it. Oh God, Abby covered her mouth. Is that... Colton left the object by the transformer and ran towards our position. He didn't notice us hiding in the shadows until we got really close. And that's when his expression turned to anger. What are you doing here? What, what the heck are you? Abby was nearly hyperventilating. Colton, please tell me that's not a bomb, I said. I told you both to stay by the manhole. Colton, is it? He smirked. You really think some dumb video is going to stop this company? They'll say that it's fabricated, and if not, they'll bring in another inspection, and the company will pay them off like they always do. He was so heated, he was almost speaking in a normal voice. Babe, this is serious, Abby said. We're talking terrorism charges you do not want. I know exactly what I want, Colton said almost shouting. And at that moment I saw it the burner phone in Colton's vest pocket, the trigger only inches away. I could easily grab it. This may be my only shot, no time to think. I grabbed the phone, my fingers grasped the plastic, but Colton grabbed my hand. Oh, what are you? It all happened so fast, a matter of seconds. We wrestled for the flip phone, but Colton was much stronger. He wrenched it from my hands, causing the phone to open, and then his thumb accidentally pressed the call button. A static shock burned his finger. Ow! The bomb was small but powerful, and so loud. It blew apart the transformer instantly, sending sparks and shrapnel everywhere. A small piece lodged itself into Abby's thigh. The lights went out. It was so dark that I couldn't even see my hands in front of my face. The humming stopped, the cricket stopped, all the noise stopped. It was deathly silent for a few seconds. And then I heard something that will haunt me for the rest of my life. A distant chorus of screams. It was as if hundreds or thousands of people were crying out in agony. Some of the voices sounded old and frail, some like children, and some didn't sound human at all. They cried in unison like they were all a part of one whole, a series of mouths attached to a giant beast. 
I had no idea what the screams were, but I was certain of one thing. They were all coming from inside the power plant. The ground shook like a series of undulating waves. The three of us fell to the ground. I heard concrete cracking in the buildings nearby. The ground was breaking apart. I thought the whole world was about to end. But then the power returned and the screaming chorus stopped mid-shriek. Some backup generator had apparently kicked on and humming filled the air. Crickets were chirping again and all seemed normal. I sat up, noticing the bloody gash on Abby's leg. Abby, you're... But she wasn't paying attention to her wound. Abby was crouched over Colton looking despondent. He's not breathing. Colton lay motionless on the ground, his right hand still gripping the flip phone. It was charred to a crisp. His hand was singed. Abby started to perform CPR when Colton suddenly woke up. His eyes bulged like they were going to pop out of his head. Colton? He glared at us like we were strangers. We need to get... Colton screamed. It was a loud and ear-splitting scream. So loud that I had to cover my ears. Abby started to cry and we knew that it was over. Seconds later, a dozen flashlights fell upon us. Flashlights that were connected to rifles. Face down on the ground. Now. Hands behind your back. We were surrounded by security personnel. Abby and I did as instructed. But Colton just lay there staring up at the night sky. His eyes and mouth wide. Crap, that's the alarm for lights out. I gotta log off, but check back here soon. I'll finish this report. I must. Okay, I'm back. For those of you who are new, please check my first transmission above. I'm going to try and write as much as I can, but I can't guarantee that I'll get through it all. The guards are doing random cell checks now. I have to be extra cautious. Face down on the ground, now, hands behind your back. I felt a pair of cold metal cuffs clamp down on my wrist. Am I under arrest? Not quiet. The power plant's security guards dragged Abby and I to our feet, our hands cuffed behind our backs. The guards wore tactical body armor, the kind of stuff you would see the special forces wearing. Definitely not what you would expect for a power company. And gas masks covered their heads. Don't say another word. Their voices were filtered through small speakers attached to the masks. The other guards grabbed Colton. He was still lying on the ground in a catatonic state. I didn't see what happened next because somebody covered my head in a thick black cloth bag. It was pitch black inside. Even the sound was muffled. God, my parents are going to kill me, I thought. I was their oldest son, the responsible one, never getting in trouble, always making straight A's. They didn't even know that I was a part of the Night Riders. All our urban exploration missions were nights that I supposedly slept over at my friend's house, a fellow Night Rider. I had never even been grounded for Christ's sakes. For them to learn that I had trespassed on a power plant, no, that I was a part of a bombing, are we terrorists now? The guards led us down a dozen yards away. We were placed into the back of an SUV or a van, some sort of big vehicle. It didn't drive very far. When we got out, the air felt still, like we were inside a vacuum-sealed room. The footsteps echoed off of distant walls. The soles of my shoes squeaked on the floor, probably tile. What is this place, I wondered. Some kind of CIA black site. Were we being led to a prison cell or something worse? You're not under arrest, a woman's voice said nearby. I think she was escorting us. She sounded concerned, yet kind and gentle. Then why am I in cuffs? For your own safety, the woman said. Her voice sounded filtered too, probably speaking through a gas mask or a hazmat suit. Safety? How would we be a danger to ourselves? My footsteps went from squeaks to metal clangs. The sounds were closer now, louder. We had entered a small room. Somebody led me to a chair, forcing me to sit down. They strapped my hands and legs to the metal furniture. 
and then they removed the cloth bag from my head. What? I was sitting inside a large windowless box with metal tubing covering the walls and ceiling. The guards who led me there quickly left the room, closing a steel door behind them, the only exit. Jason, where are we? I craned my neck. Abby was in a chair facing the opposite direction, also tied down. I don't know. Did you see what happened to Cole? A loud squeaking interrupted us. Microphone feedback. And then I heard the kind woman's voice again, filtered through a speaker somewhere inside the room. Just relax. The decontamination process will only take a few seconds. It may look scary, but we promise that it's painless. Painless? There was a loud mechanical whine. The tubes covering every inch of the room began to glow deep orange. A horrible thought crossed my mind at that moment. It felt like Abby and I were inside a giant oven, and they had just set it to its maximum temperature. The glow became brighter and the whining grew louder, but there was no heat. If anything, the air inside the room was cooler than before. Cold, icy cold. I tried to open my mouth to speak, but I was suddenly overcome with exhaustion. My eyelids grew let in, and before I knew anything else, darkness. I woke with a gasp, lying in a hospital. My clothes were gone, and I was naked beneath a gown. Various medical devices beeped and whirled around me. There were electrodes attached to my head and neck and chest. An oxygen mask covered my face and an IV was hooked into my right arm. Hello? I tried moving my arms, but they were restrained. I was strapped to the bed. I'm sure they would say that it was for my own safety, but it certainly felt like I was a prisoner. I checked my surroundings. The room didn't have any windows, at least not to the outside. There was one window, but it only revealed an adjacent room, similarly decked out with medical equipment. Am I in an ICU? I couldn't tell if it was still night or the following day, or even days later. Abby and Colton were nowhere to be seen. A man entered the room. He was tall and wearing a full-body hazmat suit. Hey, where am I? I was worried my voice was muffled because of the oxygen mask. The man glanced at me. He looked like some old college professor. Hey, it's okay, we're just running a few more tests. Tests? Tests for what? Where are my friends? The man didn't answer. He turned around, checking the machines while writing notes on an iPad. That's when I saw a symbol emblazoned on the back of his hazmat. I nearly gasped. It was the same circuit board that I saw on the drains, the one with all the wires that led to a grotesque humanoid shape. There was no writing accompanying the symbol. Where am I? Still no answer. A light turned on in the adjacent hospital room. I watched through the window as a group of hazmats wheeled in someone on a stretcher. I could barely see the patient, just glimpses through the crowd. It was a woman and she wore a uniform for the Frog Hollow power plant. Her skin was pale, almost translucent. But that's not what made me scream. What made me scream were the fungal growths that were sprouting from her eyelids and mouth. They were blue-green and shaped like flowers, glowing faintly beneath the fluorescence above. The fungi bloomed, revealing tiny mouths within, tiny screaming mouths. The screams were shrill like steam issuing from a boiling tea kettle. And as soon as I had heard them, I screamed too. Like an involuntary reaction. Like the screaming was contagious. And the hazmat monitoring me grabbed a syringe and hooked it into my IV. As soon as he depressed the plunger, I was overcome. Darkness. I woke up on a thin cot, immediately sitting up. Was it a nightmare? I was wearing a plain blue jumpsuit, no longer restrained. That's when I took in my surroundings. Screw me. I was inside a tiny, windowless prison cell. Just a bed, a sink, and a toilet. Thick metal bars covered the entrance. I'm not under arrest, huh? 
Beyond the bars lay a blank hallway, no signage, and no windows, no evidence of where I was. And then I heard something that gave me hope. Jason, are you awake? It was Abby and she sounded close. Where are you? In the cell next to yours. They brought us here after the hospital. Who's they? The power plant people, Abby said. I think we're still here. I think we're somehow under the main facility. A million questions ran through my head. How much did Abby know? How much had she seen? Did she see the fungus? Was that even real or just some drug-induced hallucination? Abby, I finally said. What's happened to us? Where's Colton? I don't know. Her voice was hoarse like she had been crying. Are we contaminated by something? No. I nearly jumped. Somebody was standing right outside of my cell. An Asian woman mid-forties wearing a fancy tailored suit. Short haircut and a serious expression. She was flanked by two muscular guards holding rifles. Before I could speak. What were you three doing here? We're not saying anything unless you tell us what happened to our friend, Abby said. She sounded defiant, but there was a strong undercurrent of fear in her voice. The woman pursed her lips. Oh, I'm sorry, let's start from the beginning. My name is Yumiko. I'm the new owner of Frog Hollow, the facility that the three of you just tried to blow up. We didn't mean to. The words just spilled out of my mouth. But as soon as I had said them, I knew how ridiculous they sounded. They had obviously seen the explosion and its aftermath. I mean, we never planned. I stopped short. I didn't want to place the blame on Colton. They wouldn't believe me even if I tried. How about you tell me your names first? No, Abby said. You have no right to detain us like this. You're not police. This is... What? Kidnapping? Yumiko laughed. You have no idea how much trouble you've caused. She paced back and forth between our adjacent cells as she continued. You've done immense damage to this facility. We still don't know the full extent, but it will take a long time to get everything back to normal. And as for your friend, he's currently in our intensive care ward suffering from toxic shock. Toxic shock? How much do you know about this place? Yumiko stared into my eyes. Nothing, I almost said. Colton was the one who had handled all the power plant research, though that was relatively scant according to him. There was very little public information about the plant's state-of-the-art natural gas facility. According to Colton, who spent hours scouring the internet, the details were annoyingly vague. But Abby remained silent next door and I wasn't going to give up anything if she wasn't. Look, the police are on their way now, Yumiko said. But I can help your case if you give me something to work with. She kept pacing. Are there any others involved with this bombing? No answer. How long have you been planning this operation? No answer. And did you see anything tonight that you couldn't explain? Anything unusual? Still nothing. Abby continued her silence next door. But I was getting antsy, pulling my hair, rubbing my sweaty palms against the pants of my jumpsuit. Yumiko keyed in on this. She stopped pacing between the cells, focusing only on me instead of the both of us. You don't have to tell them about the bombing, you know. I could simply say that you were trespassing on the property and you accidentally triggered a power surge. Her iridescent green eyes locked onto mine. It's just us, I said. Just the three of us. Jason! Abby blurted angrily from next door, but she stopped short, recognizing her faux pas. Oh, Jason, is it? Yumiko smiled. Well, Jason, do you mind telling me more about this plan the three of you had concocted? Is our friend going to be okay? I asked. His condition's stable, but it will take time for him to fully heal. We heard screaming when the bomb went off. Well, those were the screams of our employees. They were scared for their lives. It didn't sound like human screaming, I said. I'm sorry, are you the one running this interrogation? 
Yumiko asked. You answer my questions or you'll receive no help when the authorities arrive. Don't say anything else. Abby blurted from next door. I had to force my mouth shut. My mind was brimming with so many unanswered questions. So many burning mysteries. But Abby was right. There was no use saying more. We couldn't trust anything that the power plant workers said. What reason would they have to help us? After we had allegedly tried to blow up their plant. We'll wait for the police to arrive. Abby said with some finality. Thank you. Yumiko issued a long sigh staring at the floor. Fine, she said. And then she looked back up to me. She was about to say something more when her phone had vibrated in her pocket. Yumiko pulled out the cell answering. Yes? A muffled voice answered. I couldn't hear what the person on the other end was saying but they sounded frantic, downright terrified. Yumiko didn't speak the whole time. She only held the phone to her ear listening and her face grew more and more concerned by the second. Finally, she hung up. What was that? I asked, referring to the call. Yumiko just looked at me with this strange expression, like a deer in the headlights. And then she motioned to her armed guards and the three of them left on the hall, shutting a door behind them. Hey, I shouted. Wait, what's going on? I forget it, Abby said. They're not going to tell us anything. I went up to the bars near where our two cells met. How's the leg? Fine, they patched it up in the hospital ward. You were there too. I thought about the fungal victim in the ICU. Did she see that woman too? Abby, what the heck is really going on here? You heard that screaming right when the bomb went off. I don't know what I heard, Abby said. But I don't think this place is running on natural gas or coal or whatever the heck they tell the public. It might not even be a power plant. What do you mean? You saw those armed guards. Well, yeah. This feels like something military, Abby said. Like a top secret project. The power plant is just a cover for it. Military? Yeah, like they're building weapons here or something. You're right, maybe chemical weapons. I saw somebody in the hospital. She, she looked like she had some kind of disease. I sighed. The immensity of the stuff that we were in was still catching up with me. We're going to prison for this, aren't we? Abby started to respond, but she cut herself off as all the lights went off in the building, plunging us into pitch darkness. Crap, another power surge. We heard muffled shouting coming from somewhere deeper in the building, too far to discern what they were saying, but there were a lot of voices and they all sounded frantic. Almost as soon as they had started, the voices stopped, replaced with gunshots. Machine gun fire echoed through the distant hallways. I ran to the back of my cell, covering behind the cot. Jesus, it sounded like a war was raging. Abby must be right. This was some kind of military base. I curled into a ball and shut my eyes hoping that it would all be over soon. The gunshots died down but they were replaced with something worse. Heavy thuds one after another. After another. The noises brought a sickening image to mind. Bodies hitting the floor, blood is splattering the walls. Finally, the thudding stopped and all was quiet. I kept my eyes shut. After a few seconds, a series of soft yellow emergency lights flickered to life, and then I heard the creaking of metal doors. I opened my eyes. The door to my cell was ajar. Huh? I was still hunched in the back corner of the room, terrified of what lay in the gloom beyond, until I heard a familiar voice. Jason. Colton stood outside my cell. He wore a jumpsuit just like mine. His right hand was bandaged, the hand that he had held the flip phone with, but otherwise he appeared unharmed. I'm back again, sorry for the delay. Internet access has been spotty down here lately. For those of you who are new, please check my first two transmissions above. Colton was outside the cell, 
He wore a jumpsuit just like mine. His right hand was bandaged to the hand that held the flip phone, but otherwise he appeared unharmed. It's okay, you guys can come out. Abby emerged from herself first. She stared at her boyfriend in astonishment, mouth agape. You're... Colton nodded. Abby rushed to hug him. I thought you were dead. And Colton kissed her on the forehead. That's alright, babe. It was just a bad shock. He held up his bandaged hand. I'm fine now. I got to my feet. We heard gunshots. I know. Colton ushered me forward. Uh, come on, I'll explain it on the way. And I walked out of my cell. The hallway beyond was empty, nondescript and windowless, like so much else in the facility. Emergency lights illuminated the cramped space. There were a handful of other prison cells in the corridor, all of them empty. This way, Colton led us in the opposite direction that Yumiko and her armed guards went earlier. Where are we going? Abby asked. We're getting the heck out of here. Abby and I followed close behind, our eyes whipping in all directions, searching for other guards or prisoners. Were you locked up in here with us? I asked. I'm not in this ward, Colton said. I was in another section. But somebody helped me break out, another prisoner. Who? Abby asked. Ash, Colton said. He worked here until he turned to whistleblower and they locked him up. Seems even the employees were getting fed up with how this place is run. A thin sheen of sweat covered Colton's forehead. His eyes were wide. He looked amped, as if high on adrenaline. Ash figured out a way to hack the locks in our ward. Where is Ash now? Abby asked, a tad suspicious. Colton's face fell. I knew before he even said it. He didn't make it. So they were shooting at you. I thought of the gunshots that we had heard earlier. It had sounded like a war was raging in the next room over. A bunch of us got out at the same time, Colton said. Some fought back, others ran, like myself. We had reached the end of the hallway. Colton bent down and removed a metal panel near the floor. I was lucky to make it. He wiped the sweat from his forehead. But Ash told me about a way that we can sneak out. He finished removing the panel, revealing a small dark tunnel beyond. It appeared to be some kind of access way full of tangled wiring. Barely big enough for any of us to squeeze through. Least of all, Colton. Through there? Abby asked, her suspicion rising. I crouched down. The access way was too dark to see where it led. The tunnel appeared to turn sharply to the right about a dozen feet inside. But what other choice did we have? We were criminals now and they were likely armed guards at every exit. Well, it's not like we can just walk out the front door, I said. Abby smirked. She stared into the passage. You sure this was the right creepy tunnel that Ash had mentioned? Yeah, he was real specific, Colton said. I know it looks tight, but... Colton took a deep breath and squeezed his big shoulders through the entrance. Only his butt and feet were sticking out now. If I can fit. Then the rest of him disappeared into the tunnel. I turned to Abby. Hey, you go next, I'll take up the rear, just in case. Abby sighed. We crawled on all fours through the cramped passage, a single file. Colton first, then Abby, and then myself. I thought the drains could be claustrophobic, but this was much, much worse. The loose wiring felt like tiny snakes brushing up against my backside. I never wanted to bolt out of a place faster in my life. I kept fearing that I would get electrocuted, but it seemed that none of the wires were live. Most of the building's power was still out. Fortunately, the tunnel didn't last long. We rounded a few tight corners and then saw a light up ahead. Is that daylight? I asked. I couldn't see past Colton's big frame. I know, but we're getting close. Colton and Abby crawled out, giving me my first look at our destination. It appeared to be a vast space. 
There was a loud, periodic hissing noise. I couldn't quite place it. And not until I crawled out of the tunnel. What the? We were in a massive chamber full of giant metal tubing. The room must have been hundreds of feet tall and God knows how wide. The endless tubing reminded me of those fun tunnel mazes that you would see in an indoor playground. Only these tunnels were made of gray featureless metal and many of them vented steam on a regular basis. The source of the hissing noise that I'd heard in the access tunnel. Where are we? Abby asked. I should mention this place, Colton said. It's the ventilation center. These tubes vent steam, wastewater, and various gases from the core. Where's the way out? I searched the area for an exit sign, but I found none. There were no windows either. All the light came from yellow emergency panels placed at various locations near the floor, leaving most of the room cloaked in shadow. Hmm, it's... Colton scanned our vicinity. It's through here. He walked deeper into the room, his body disappearing behind some low-hanging pipes. They lead to condensation onto the concrete floor. Uh, Colton, wait. Abby ran after him and I followed after. What? Colton said stopping. This doesn't feel right, Abby said. It seems like we're heading deeper into the power plant, not out of it. Well, this is the way that Ash said. Are you sure? How long were you even speaking to this man? I mean, our cells were right next to each other. He knows every inch of this place. Jason? Abby turned to me. What do you think? Now there it is again, and just like with the frogs and the drains earlier, I was the tiebreaker. Abby, what other way would we take? I don't know, but this. Her voice trailed off. She appeared deep in thought. Look, Ash knows this place inside and out, Colton said. Trust me, we're going the right way. I looked at Abby. She seemed worried, and her intuition was almost never wrong. Jason, come on, man, Colton said. We'd be out of here by now if we didn't stop to have this chat. I was still uncertain. We all stood there in silence for a beat. Colton started walking further into the room. You can follow if you want, but you better do it now. The guards will be searching here soon. As soon as Colton left, Abby pointed to a heavy-duty monkey wrench lying on the ground nearby. Take that. What? Just in case. I found it odd that she didn't ask her boyfriend to grab the weapon instead. And Colton was obviously much stronger than myself. Perhaps her distrust wasn't with Ash, but with him. Stay close, Abby told me as we started to follow Colton. I grabbed the wrench. The metal rod felt heavy and cold in my sweaty hands. Abby, Jason. Oh, we're coming, Abby said. I gripped the wrench, scared by the thought of using it. I had never even been in a fight before, and now here I was holding a weapon capable of breaking bones. I won't have to use it, I told myself. I kept repeating that over and over, like a mantra. Abby and I had been through a lot tonight. We're just overly anxious. Colton is leading us out of here. We're going home. My parents are going to kill me and the cops will likely be waiting to arrest me. But I'll deal with all of those things later. Let's just get out of this creepy place first. Come on. Colton sounded close, hidden behind a thick batch of tubing. His voice was slightly muffled by all the steam. Abby was the first to pass through. I heard her gasp as soon as she had arrived on the other side. Oh my god. I ran ahead. Abby grabbed my arm as soon as I had passed through, stopping me from going forward. What the? We were standing in a charred section of the room. It was as if a massive fire had flowed through the space. Most of the tubing was melted. Liquefied metal dripped on the floor. Colton, Abby called out. But he was nowhere to be seen. It was so quiet, too quiet, and then... <laughs> A sudden hacking cough drew our attention. It was coming from behind a nearby bulkhead. Colton? 
and we headed towards the noise. The voice sounded raspy like somebody struggling to breathe. Did Colton accidentally breathe in the toxic fumes? I suddenly wished that we had our masks again. Colton, where are you? Abby and I crept toward the bulkhead. It was charred completely black, its melted surface bumpy and bulbous. As we drew closer, I saw the surface had a distinctive shape. It looked oddly familiar. Oh crap, Abby jumped back. She was the first to notice. I stepped closer and the coughing quickly turned into a pained groan, a groan of utter agony. Only then did I see a section of the bulkhead open up. A hole had formed in its charred surface. No, not a hole. It was a mouth. The bulkhead had a mouth and it was groaning. Up close, I could see the wall's lumpy surface was in the shape of a human body. I could just make out the charred uniform with its circuit board symbol. The same symbol I saw in the drains and later in the ICU. We were right next to a power plant employee who had melted into the bulkhead. He was fused to the structure but somehow still alive. A pair of bloodshot eyes opened staring at Abby and I, pleading for death. The screaming reached a fever pitch. Oh forget this, Abby said. We ran in the opposite direction trying to get as far away from that monstrosity as we could, but the screams followed us. There were dozens more people all fused to the charred remains of walls and tubing. Abby and I kept turning in different directions, but we couldn't find our way back. We were lost. Oh God, Colton, Abby cried. Where are you? I stared at the half-melted body surrounding us. Was Colton one of them? Had we entered some kind of chemical weapons testing area? I'm sorry you had to see this. Ash, I didn't mention this on the shortcut. Abby and I turned. Colton was right behind us and he looked calm, peaceful even, but he was now holding a handgun. Colton held it in his right hand, the hand that he had pressed the bomb trigger. He had removed the bandages on that hand, revealing charred flesh underneath. Colton's burn had grown larger, creeping up his right arm. Oh Jesus, Colton, Abby said, moving closer to my side. He didn't mean to harm them, Colton said. The fused people screamed louder now, as if Colton's presence brought them more pain. But they locked him up, torturing him day and night. Ash, he just wants to be free. Then all of this will be over. My fingers gripped the wrench tighter, trying to keep my voice calm. Colton, buddy, you're, you're unwell. We need to get you out of here, Abby said. Get you to a hospital. I'm unwell, Colton grinned. His eyes glowed blue like the fungus we had seen earlier. Had something gotten into him, infecting him? Was it going to infect us next? This world is unwell, Colton said. It's been poisoned beyond all recognition. I mean, look around you. He gestured to the charred bodies crying out in the dark. They are the sickness poisoning everything, but we can stop it. We just have to free him. Free who? Ash, Colton bellowed. He showed me a way to end all of this, to bring the earth back to how it was before we started destroying it. Baby, please drop the gun, Abby said. Let's just get out of here. Drop the gun, Colton, I added. Colton let out a heavy sigh. Fine, he said, squeezing the weapon in his charred hand. In seconds, the gunmetal turned into molten liquid dripping onto the concrete floor. It was completely destroyed. You can melt with the rest of them. Colton lunged at us. I swung the monkey wrench as hard as I could, but Colton caught it in his burnt hand. I felt intense heat like I had just touched boiling water. I immediately let go of the wrench in moments before it turned to molten lead. Run. Abby and I sprinted away, ducking under nearby tubing. We ran deeper into the maze, past burned out sections of piping, charred computer stations, melted walls. All the while, sounds of crashing metal followed us. 
Colton, he was gaining on us. The ground rumbled like an earthquake. Where are we going? I don't know, I said, and I didn't care. So long as we remained alive and weren't melted into the walls like the other poor souls around us. Jason! Abby pointed towards the door in the far corner. It had a bright red sign over it marked exit. Finally! We beelined it for the door but we didn't get far. Colton's path of destruction behind us had caused a series of pipes to burst overhead, spilling hot wastewater everywhere. Abby and I tried out running the torrent but it quickly overtook us, causing us to slip and fall into the sloshing mass. The water was warm, dirty, and bitter. Some of it got in my mouth as I struggled to catch my breath. Abby, I cried out, but she was lost in the deluge. The water kept carrying me all the way to the opposite end of the room, where a group of hulking figures stood. A gloved hand grabbed me, pulling me out of the torrent. I briefly saw Colton charging through the flooded building, headed right for me when... A huge cloud of icy smoke overtook him. Colton staggered. Ice crystals formed on his face and hands. I looked to my side. One of the plant's security guards had grabbed me, her face obscured by a gas mask and her body covered in tactical armor. Another guard stood beside her holding what appeared to be some kind of massive flamethrower. Only instead of flame, this weapon spewed billowing clouds of icy smoke that enveloped Colton. He had stopped moving. I'm sorry that you had to see this, a filtered voice said. It was the person who had pulled me up. Her voice, it sounded familiar. Yumiko? The woman nodded. She was the power plant's owner. You can stop now, Yumiko told her partner. The guard turned off his ice thrower and the white clouds surrounding Colton had dissipated. He had turned into a giant icicle. Everything went quiet again. The rushing torrent had finally calmed, leaving the whole room flooded under three feet of smelly wastewater. Is he dead? I asked, staring at Colton's frozen face. No, Yumiko said. The entity is merely dormant for now. The entity that's our friend, Abby and I, oh god. I looked around the flooded room suddenly realizing that Abby was nowhere in sight. Did she drown? Abby! Abby! We'll find her, the other guard said. His voice also filtered through a gas mask. The wastewater drains into a series of sluice gates at the edges. She probably fell into one of them. We need to find her and get the heck out of. What we need to do now is secure the plant's core, Yumiko said. It's become unstable. She turned to me, and you're coming with us. What? This isn't a power plant, I said, anger bubbling. This is, this is, it's messed up. You've got people locked up in here torturing them. Somebody named Ash. Yumiko grabbed my arm, her voice worried. He told you about Ash. Yeah, Colton said you locked up one of your employees and were torturing him, I said. He wanted to free Ash. Ash isn't a person, Yumiko said. Ash is the power plant's core, our fuel source. Ash is some kind of fuel? Yumiko let out a long, pained sigh, and then she said, Ash is a demon. Okay, I'm finally ready to talk about what led to me being locked up here. Hopefully this last message will serve as a warning. If you haven't already, please check out the first three transmissions above before reading further. So the core is a demon. I would have laughed were it not for what I had just witnessed in the ventilation room. That's our best guess, given the entity's nature, Yumiko said. She stared at a tablet computer reading damage reports as she led us deeper into the power plant. We passed through rooms full of arcane equipment Giant metal vats bubbling over with blue liquid, jet black turbines, walls of glowing occult symbology. The further that we went, the less everything looked like a power plant and more it started to resemble a futuristic temple. Yumiko radioed a bunch of people as we walked. She directed a team to go and fetch Colton. 
He was still an icicle sitting in the ventilation room. Yumiko claimed they were going to take him to the ICU to thaw out. She didn't sound hopeful when she said this, however. Another team was sent to search for Abby. How likely is it that they'll find her alive? I asked. They'll do everything they can, Yumiko said. That sounds unlikely. Why am I here? Somebody will explain it to you when we reach the core. That was all that Yumiko said on the matter before radioing more employees. I thought of asking more questions, but she was clearly too busy. Yumiko had given me a hazmat suit to wear, complete with the Frog Hollow logo. It was that strange circuit board symbol with a grotesque human stick figure in the center that I now assumed was the demon Ash. The suit was bulky, clearly meant for someone a foot taller and a hundred pounds heavier than myself. But it was high quality material and perfectly sealed. We saw dozens more workers as we continued onward. All of them wore hazmats, and all of them carried weapons, mostly rifles and handguns. But a few carried those strange ice thrower weapons that had frozen Colton. I overheard Yumiko refer to these specialized guns as cryo lances. She directed some of the cryo lancers to secure the station's perimeter, while others came with us, serving as our guards. And this is it, Yumiko said. We had reached a large stairwell with only one way to go down. Stay behind the cryo lancers, they need to check the area first. Check for what? Yumiko didn't answer. We descended six flights until we reached the bottom of the stairwell. It led to a deep tunnel underground. The sector was hewn out of limestone like the interior of an old mine. There were occult symbols everywhere carved into the ceiling, the walls, and even the rocky floor. It was like somebody had written a massive protection spell. At the end of the tunnel was a cavern containing a giant metal box. Various wires and tubes sprouted from its sides, leading up to the ceiling and presumably the rest of the power station. Is that the core? Yes. There were numerous burn marks along the core's metal edges, as if a raging inferno had threatened to burst out of it. Long strings of glowing fungus grew across its polished steel surface. The same kind of fungus that I had seen in the drains earlier and on the worker in the ICU. Clearly, the gross were a sign of the demon's presence. Ice those tendrils, Yumiko told the cryolancers. They lifted their bulky weapons, spraying icy smoke on the core. The fungus strings quickly froze and flaked off of its metal exterior. I was told to stay back near the cavern entrance while the hazmats had finished their cleaning. Seeing the fungus tendrils freeze into icy dust made me wonder if the same thing would happen to Colton when they finally thought him out. My hope for his survival was dropping by the second though. Yumiko glanced back. What are you doing? She yelled at the guards by my side. And get him prepped for the transmission. We're almost done here. Yes, ma'am. The guards ushered me over to a computer station in the back corner of the cavern. The area was connected to the plant's core via a series of wires taped to the floor. Scientists worked feverishly at a giant computer terminal with dozens of computer screens. Most of them flashed warnings in red letters. Containment breach. Meltdown imminent. Everybody was laser focused on their work. The lead scientist scoffed when she saw me. Why is he here? He's our best chance at communication, Yumiko said coming over. This boy survived close proximity with one of the thralls. His mind is still intact. Thrall, what was that? Were they talking about Colton? What's going on? I asked. Nobody answered. One of the guards held my shoulder as if making sure that I wouldn't bolt out of the cavern. What about the other techno priests? The lead scientist had asked. She kept working at her computer as she talked, feverishly typing out code. Out of commission, Yumiko said. 
all of them? There are others on the way, but they won't be here for another four hours, minimum. We need to patch in now. The lead scientist stopped for a moment, glancing at me. He's not even trained. Then we'll be quick, far below the limit, Yumiko said. Set a timer for 90 seconds. We just need to calm it down. Will somebody please tell me what the heck is going on? I was shocked by the tone of my voice. Everyone fell silent staring at me. There was an awkward beat and then... I just prep him, Yumiko told the lead scientist. And before we have another breach. And with that, she left the station. Returning to the cryolancers who were finishing cleaning the core. A tag in her hazmat suit said that she was named Sophie. You can let go of him, Sophie told the guard holding my shoulder. We'll take it from here. I recognized Sophie's voice. This was the woman who had led me through the decontamination process earlier, right after the bombing. The one with the soft and gentle tone. Look, whatever this is, if you think it's too risky, I'm more than fine leaving, I said. I don't want to be here. I know, Sophie said. And I'm sorry, but we have to try. You're Jason, right? Yes. Well, my name's Sophie. I'm a communication specialist at Frog Hollow. Now, Jason, I'm going to need you to be very brave for me, okay? What you're about to do could save many lives. The whole power plant and beyond. Okay. Sophie led me to a windowless metal pod at the back of the computer station. It was about the size of an SUV. Various wires connected it to the computer terminal. I'm going in there. Yes, you'll be fine. I'm going in with you. I'll be right beside you. Once we were sealed inside, Sophie and I removed our hazmats. The pod was crammed with medical equipment. An articulated chair lay in its center, like the kind you would find in a dentist's office. It was almost fully reclined. Dozens of electrodes were attached to its sides. Sophie motioned to the chair. Lie down here. What is this? My whole body was shaking as I got into the chair. I sank deep into its plush leather cushions. We're going to patch you into the plant's core, Sophie said. This pod has highly specialized receptors. They can connect a human consciousness with ash. What? No, I don't want to talk to what's in there. I know and I'm sorry. Sophie placed my right finger into a pulse oximeter, and then she began attaching the electrodes to my forehead and scalp using a cold gel. But you won't have to say anything. All I need for you to do is relax and keep your mind open. We'll do all the communication on our end. Then why don't you sit in this chair? Oh, it's not that simple, Sophie said. We need a human conduit who's had contact with the demon. You had direct contact with a thrall, somebody that's under Ash's control. Uh, Colton? Yes. Is he going to be alright? Honestly, I don't know. Sophie finished placing the electrodes on my body. My scalp tingled. Normally, we would use someone specially trained for this kind of thing. Someone who's had experienced in small regular doses of a demonic contact while entering a meditative state. You mean the techno priest? Yes. I couldn't believe such a job really existed. In my mind, I pictured somebody in flowing robes embroidered with the circuit board logo. I felt that I had to ask the next question, though I dreaded its answer. What did Yumiko mean when she said that the techno priests were out of commission? Sophie checked a heart monitor nearby. It tracked my vital signs. They're too tired to sit in this chair, she said. Her voice was slightly different, less certain. She was lying. Your heart rate's elevated, Jason. Well, yeah, duh, I'm terrified. Can you get somebody else to do this, please? I asked. I'm sorry, Jason, Sophie said. The transmission will feel strange, but it will only last a minute. And I'll be right by your side the whole time. In case anything bad happens, okay? 
She looked at me with a soft expression, her crystal blue eyes watering. She's terrified too. Okay. Sophie pressed an intercom button inside the pod. We're clear. She checked my vitals one more time and then said, Now lie back and relax and it'll be over before you know it. I smirked, yeah, famous last words. Sophie pulled a lever and the tangling in my scalp intensified. And then I felt a wave of heat spread across my head like my hair was on fire. I tried to scream but nothing came out. My jaw wouldn't open. My arms and legs wouldn't move. I was paralyzed. It was like a waking nightmare. And then things got really, really strange. I was standing in a boggy swamp, my legs frozen in place. Giant insects crowded the humid air. There were moss-covered trees and dark brown water in all directions. Booming animal calls echoed in the distance. The noises were loud and resonant. They reminded me of giant birds. A huge creature with red and green pebbled skin lumbered through the murky surroundings on forest out legs. It was headed my way. It took me a moment to realize what it was. My eyes widened in fear and awe. It was a dinosaur, one of those massive but docile herbivores that I had seen in countless science documentaries. Only this one was real. I could smell its musky odor, feel the vibration of its thunderous footsteps. Dream or nightmare, this was the most incredible sight that I had ever witnessed, until something even more magnificent surpassed it. A prismatic light passed by overhead. I looked up and saw an ethereal creature floating through the treetops. Its iridescent body was so faint that it took me a moment to realize that it was an actual being and not just a trick of the light. The creature resembled a translucent manta ray hovering over the swamp. The nearby dino paid it no attention. I felt like I was the only one who could see the spirit. It gazed down at me with dozens of shiny eyes shining like tiny stars. As it did, I heard a soft voice in my head, as gentle as a summer breeze. Hello, Jason. You know my name. I'm in your mind and you are in mine. Ash. For some reason, I didn't feel any fear. The being seemed to radiate calmness. I felt like I could stand in that swamp for years. Where am I? My past. A sudden bright flash overtook the swamp. I didn't move from my spot, but now I was standing in a frozen wasteland riddled with ash and snow. The sky was covered in thick dark clouds, blocking almost all the sunlight out. But still, the spirit hovered above. It flapped its mighty wings and moved the clouds, allowing for warm sunlight to reach the ground. A tiny plant sprouted in the sunlit patch. I have watched over this plot of earth for longer than you could ever comprehend. Another flash. I was standing on an icy tundra. Woolly mammoths wandered in the distance. They followed the spirit. It was leading them to a bubbling stream nearby. Another flash. I was in a temperate rainforest full of huge trees and colorful fungus. A bonfire glowed nearby. People in animal furs danced around the flames, chanting in strange tongues and pointing towards the glowing spirit above them. Another flash. I stood at the bottom of a huge black pit. Mining excavators dug deeper and deeper into the earth. I looked around for the spirit, but it was no longer there. There was nothing living in sight, just dirt and machines, until I was wrenched from it. The excavator's bucket struck something hard. The machine readjusted around the buried object digging at its sides, and then it lifted out a giant chunk of glowing stone. It had the same shimmery iridescence as the floating spirit I saw earlier. The stone radiated tremendous energy. It washed over the excavator in tremendous waves, causing the machine's computers to short out. Another flash. I was inside a steel box alongside the glowing stone. 
Blasts of fire hit the stone from tubes up above, causing the object to release more and more energy. They realized I could provide them with boundless energy, but with each ounce siphoned off, I lost more and more of myself. In the corner I saw the spirit, once a shimmering creature of beauty it now resembled a cancerous blob of bubbling tar. Its tiny star eyes had turned into fiery coals. They burned red, blood red, rage red. I felt its rage surging through me, burning up my soul. There's a button on the computer terminal outside your pod. It's big and red and you can't miss it. One more big flash and... I opened my eyes. Blinking away the tears, everything was bright and blurry. Somebody stood over me. Jason, Jason! It was Sophie. She had sprayed something into my lungs with a large inhaler. I gasped myself awake, heart pounding. What? What? I was back in the pod. My scalp burned. Sophie had ripped the electrodes off of my head, taking some of my hair with them. What happened? You went into convulsions for a few seconds when I switched on the transceiver, Sophie said. I had to do a hard aborder. You would have entered a coma. Sorry about the spray. The adrenaline's just to pull you out. But I was speaking to it, I said. That's not possible, Sophie said. We hadn't even established a full connection yet. It was. I wanted to say beautiful and then terrifying and then enraging. I saw it. I saw Ash. You were hallucinating. Sophie helped me back into my hazmat and then she suited up herself. The pod door unsealed with a pneumatic kiss. We stepped out. What the heck happened? Yumiko was waiting for us outside. She looked pissed. He started seizing immediately, Sophie said. Could he still establish a connection? I'm not going to kill him just so we can get a baseline for what's going on in there. We could all die if we don't know what it's thinking. Yumiko was shouting now. She and Sophie continued arguing, but I no longer paid them any attention. I was laser focused on that big red button. It was unmarked, sitting at the far end of the computer terminal, just a couple feet away, almost within reach, and there was nobody else around. The techno priest will be here soon. Well, that could be too late. We don't even know if he can. Jason! I had raised my hand over the button about to slam my palm down on its shiny red surface. What are you doing? No one moved. Yumiko, Sophie, all the scientists and guards. Everybody stared at me in abject terror. It wasn't a demon. It was a nature spirit and it only wanted to help living things. Jason, you press that button and we all die, Sophie said, trying and failing to keep her voice calm. It wants to destroy us. Well, of course it does, my body shook. I felt the horror that you put it through. A deep, unwavering rage clouded my thoughts. A desire for revenge. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I wondered. Was I a thrall now like Colton? My hand remained above the button. One of the guards raised a rifle at me, finger on the trigger. Wait! A familiar voice stayed my hand. Someone in a hazmat suit had just entered the cavern accompanied by more guards. It took me a moment to see her face through the plastic face shield. Abby? Don't do it. What are you doing here? I asked. The boss wanted her. One of the guards accompanying Abby said. I looked at Yumiko. She was still standing beside the communication pod. Were you going to plug her into that thing next? Yumiko sighed and then nodded. She would have turned Abby into a thrall too and for what? to keep some stupid power plant running. My hand inched closer to the big red button. Jason, please, Yumiko said. I'm sorry that we forced you into this. We won't put either of you in the pot, I swear. Just step away from the terminal. Why'd you do it? Do what? That. I motioned to the core. Its metal surface was steaming. Ash can solve the world's energy crisis. 
That core alone can power the entire eastern seaboard, Yumiko said. And it doesn't even release greenhouse gases. All the smoke you see outside, it's water vapor. What about the toxins released into the water supply? Toxins? There's no evidence of any toxins, Yumiko said. And that was from the old plant, before we switched. We saw the fungus growing outside, Abby said. It was in the storm drains leading to this place. You say that ash can solve the world's energy crisis, but that's only if you can keep it under control. It is a challenge, I'll admit, Yumiko said, but it's one worth taking. Look at the insurmountable odds facing our planet's future. We're destroying it faster than we ever thought possible and we still depend on fossil fuels. With this, she pointed to the plant's core, we can leave them all behind in one fell swoop. You don't know what you're dealing with, I said. And you don't even know this place existed until an hour ago, Yumiko said. Suddenly, you're an expert on the topic. No, but I know this is beyond our understanding. He's right, Abby said. I think it's safe to say you haven't done a good job controlling Ash's power if one minor outage could cause all of this. Yumiko scoffed, but there were murmurs of agreement among the gathered scientists, especially Sophie. No one spoke aloud, but I could see the tide shifting. Maybe we take a step back and... Ah! I was thrown to the floor with my hands forced behind my back. Apparently, one of the guards had snuck up behind me while I was talking. That was how I ended up where I am today, sitting inside a quarantine facility far beneath the Arizona desert. I've been here for months now. They claim it's to study my body and mind to make sure that there are no latent traces of ash still in me. Supposedly, they contacted my parents. I can only imagine how pissed they are now. The scientists have refused to let me speak with them directly for fear that I might contaminate their minds. Yumiko claims they vastly increased the security at Frog Hollow since that fateful night. They moved the plant core deeper underground, adding more walls and written spells to quell its rage. And they've decreased the core's capacity. They're starting small now, gradually working their way to more power. So the scientists claim, and Sophie's leading the charge. I wonder how she really feels about the project now, if it will ever be safe. A total of 50 employees lost their lives the night that we snuck in. According to the general public, all of them died in a massive transformer explosion. It was supposedly an accident brought on by a random power surge. The company has already paid tens of millions in life insurance and there are still lawsuits in the works. I hope they bankrupt the place. Well, at least I'm not alone. Abby and Colton are down here with me. They're in separate quarantine cells, but close enough that we can hear each other through the walls. We trade stories about the strange tests they run, the random questionnaires about nature, the strange MRI-like machines they run our bodies through every day. Each time the scientists jot down notes and we ask how we did, they always respond with the same two words, results inconclusive. We're never getting out of here, Abby told me the other night. Isn't that right, Cole? I'm okay, Colton said. It was one of his go-to responses. While Abby sounds like she's mostly recovered from her ordeal, Colton has almost become a mute. His answers are always brief, usually just a few words. I feel fine. It's cold down here. When are we leaving? Whenever Abby or I ask him about the bomb or ash or the horrors in the ventilation room, his answer remains the same. I don't remember. Is he really suffering from amnesia or does he just not want to relive those memories? Abby thinks the thawing out procedure damaged his brain. If he truly can't remember that night, then I envy him. I would give anything to forget Frog Hollow. They said it'll just be another week, I told Abby, and then we can go home. Yeah, they said that last week. True, but at least the tests are getting shorter. Perhaps that means they are finding less and less residue in our systems. 
I doubt that, Abby said. I don't think this has to do with contamination. I haven't heard Ash's voice in a week. Then why keep us here? Well, because we know too much, no matter how many NDAs they force us to sign. There was a long pause. Then Abby added, I think they already told our parents that we're dead. I don't say that. What, it's the only explanation, Abby said, unless you're still hearing things. No, I told her, but that wasn't quite true. I no longer heard Ash's voice calling out to me, but each night I had the same vivid dream. I still have it now. The demon core breaks open, releasing a great black smoke. The smoke rises up through the earth, enveloping the frog hollow power plant, causing its towers to crumble. And then it spreads across our hometown, covering every building, every person, every animal, every plant. The gray black smoke continues moving, blanketing the rest of our stage and beyond. And it stays like this for centuries, millennia, eons, choking out all life. And finally, once everything is turned to dust, the smoke evaporates, leaving behind a world reborn. Alien growths sprout from the ashen ground, lighting up the night sky with their calming glow. I don't know what this dream signifies, but it absolutely terrifies me. Not just because of all the death and destruction such an event would cause, because a part of me secretly hopes that it will come true. Perhaps I'll have to stay down here a little while longer. End transmission.